Welcome to the Economist in Your Ear podcast. When you hear about robots, especially, you know, the human-like ones, do you instantly think of a winner-takes-all race? Are we truly in just a simple sprint for global supremacy? Or is there maybe a much more complex competition unfolding? Something kind of beneath the surface that's, well, far from decided. Today, we're exploring the rising competition in humanoid robots. And we're looking particularly through the lens of a recent article from The Economist. It paints a pretty striking picture, actually. Uh, it suggests China's unique mix of, let's say, political enthusiasm and this deep, really formidable manufacturing base. Well, the idea is that this is setting China on course to outbuild America in humanoid robots, mm -hmm. much like it did with electric vehicles. Yeah, that comparison comes up a lot. They even highlighted um, a Beijing half marathon back in April where 18 humanoids took part. OK, maybe a bit of a gimmick, sure. But The Economist called it an irresistible and intentional metaphor for China's ambition. And it does grab your attention, more than a factory tour anyway. Definitely. And look, the fascination with human-like machines, it's everywhere. We're finally seeing breakthroughs, letting them leave the lab uh, and actually enter the workplace. You look at someone like Elon Musk, for instance, he's got some really ambitious predictions for Tesla's Optimus. Oh, yeah. He's suggesting thousands will be working in his factories by the end of this year. Thousands. Wow. Yeah. And predicting a million by 2030. Oh. And potentially generating over, get this, $10 trillion in annual sales for Tesla down the line. He actually said it's really bananas. Bananas might be right. And, you know, while Musk's enthusiasm is, well, let's just say high, Wall Street's forecasts, they're maybe a bit more grounded, but still incredibly significant. Okay. Goldman Sachs, for example, is now projecting a $200 billion market for humanoids within just a decade. $200 billion. Yeah. And Citigroup sees sales potentially hitting an astounding $7 trillion by 2050. Yes, yeah, $7 trillion. And Bank of America. They anticipate 3 billion humanoids by 2060. 3 billion? That's like one for every three people on Earth, basically. <laughs> Pretty much. And what's fascinating here, maybe a bit alarming depending on your perspective, is that all three banks, and even Musk himself, they all seem to expect China to be right at the forefront of this. Right. <laughs> Musk specifically voiced this concern that, you know, after Tesla at number one ranks, two through ten will be Chinese companies. But, OK, if we connect this back to the bigger picture, mm -hmm. the situation is really far from being a simple, decided race. Even though The Economist piece does a useful job spotlighting China's momentum, mm -hmm. you really need to look beyond just, you know, geography. Yeah. We have to consider things like engineering maturity, the really intricate choreography of global supply chains, and the fundamental need for shared regulatory guardrails. It's not just about who builds the most or even who builds the cheapest. It's huh. about who builds the most reliably and safely. That's the key. Right. Now, The Economist definitely points to state subsidies as a big factor in China's rise. But for someone looking at the whole picture, is that really the most decisive edge? Or are we perhaps missing something else, something maybe even more significant in China's approach here? That's a really crucial distinction to make because, yeah, subsidies matter. They play a role. But if you look deeper, the truly decisive edge is probably their ecosystem efficiency. Ecosystem efficiency. Yeah. OK, what does that mean exactly? Well, we've seen these component clusters, right, in places like Shenzhen, Chengzhou, Ningbo. They've managed to drive down the prices of actuators. Those are the crucial parts that make robots move by the pretty staggering 40 percent just since 2020. Wow, 40%. Yeah. And that kind of cost reduction, it far outpaces what direct state money alone could likely achieve. Think about it. There was this Hangzhou startup, Unitree. Their robots were literally prancing around at China's big spring festival gala. I think I saw clips of that. Yeah. And Premier Li Chang even name checked them in a speech. That kind of public endorsement. It encourages huge private sector investment. We're talking giants like Meituan, BYD, Tencent getting involved, Huawei's pursuing its own Android dreams too. Mm -hmm. And then you have Ubitech, which is a listed humanoid maker. They expect to ship maybe 500 to 1,000 units this year, but they're projecting over 10,000 by 2027. 10,000. That kind of rapid growth, that investment, mm -hmm. it speaks to this really deeply integrated self-reinforcing supply chain and just massive corporate momentum. It's tough to replicate that easily somewhere else. OK, so The Economist article then, it seems to set up this kind of brains versus brawn dynamic. The idea being America keeps the edge in AI models, you know, open AI, Google and the high end chips needed to run them mainly from NVIDIA. Right. While China dominates the physical body components. And of course, we've seen the U.S. tightening export curbs on those advanced semiconductors presumably to keep that American AI advantage. 
Right. And this is where the story gets, well, much more nuanced, I think. The whole premise that the robot brains will strictly stay American, that's being actively challenged right now. How so? Well, look at the recent progress of DeepSeek V3. That's a Chinese large language model, an LLM. It's demonstrated pretty convincingly that clever model design and uh, really careful data curation can actually substitute at least partly, for the absolute latest top-of-the-line GPUs. GPUs, the graphics processing unit. Exactly. The chip's essential for AI computation. This kind of erodes a purely hardware-centric view of brain power. Interesting. DeepSeek achieved its impressive performance using GPUs that are legal for export to China. And that really ignited a debate about whether those absolute top-tier chips are truly indispensable for AI leadership. So the hardware advantage might not be the firewall people thought. It might not be quite so clear-cut. And add to that, NVIDIA's CEO, Jensen Huang, he made a strategic trip to Beijing recently. It signals NVIDIA's intent to keep a China-compliant product line going, even with the new U.S. license rules. Wow. It just vividly shows that this U.S.-China tech interdependence, it's still there, it persists even with tighter controls. The brain of the robot isn't necessarily as geographically tied down as some narratives suggest. That is fascinating. So the article suggests America might have to, quote, start from scratch for parts if it wanted a purely domestic humanoid supply chain. Mm -hmm. But what does this really mean for the U.S. industrial base? Can it actually compete globally here? Well, yeah, that start from scratch idea, it's maybe a bit strong. It's true that for some specific components, the U.S. might have less domestic production capacity right now. Yeah. But the notion that America completely lacks a parts base, that's an oversimplification. U.S. buyers aren't starting from zero at all. They already effectively tap into a pretty robust global ecosystem. Mm. They rely heavily on European companies, actually. Like who? like Schaefle from Germany, SKF from Sweden, for critical high-precision stuff like bearings, drivetrains, linear guides. Okay, so not everything needs to be made stateside. Exactly. And as we already mentioned, NVIDIA and Microsoft, they already kind of anchored the software stack. So this clearly points to a global interconnected supply chain that's already operating, not some purely domestic race where everyone builds everything themselves. Right. Now, it's important to acknowledge the numbers 48 out of the 60 listed makers of key robot parts like eyes, hands, muscles, joints. They are indeed Chinese. That's a combined market value of like $217 billion. That's huge. It is. But Schaeffler and SKF still remain the two biggest non-Chinese volume suppliers in this space. It just underscores that ongoing international reliance. Okay, let's talk cost then. Yeah. Because those projections are really eye-opening. Bank of America suggesting Chinese humanoids could drop to, what, $17,000 for the build materials by 2030? Yeah. It almost makes it sound like cost alone just guarantees victory for China. But I wonder, is that truly the only variable that matters here? Especially when you think about operations, long-term use. That's exactly the right question to ask. Because, look, cost is absolutely crucial if you want to scale up. No doubt. Yeah. But we're already seeing that reliability is proving to be a much, much stickier hurdle than just the unit price. Like the Tesla example. Precisely. Tesla's recent Optimus production halt, it was specifically because of issues like joints overheating and poor battery life. That casts pretty significant doubt on their ambitious goal of 10,000 units for 2025. Mm -hmm. It perfectly illustrates that these real-world reliability challenges, not just attractive cost sheets, are the reasons why this quote-unquote great race is actually far from decided. Okay. And what's more, our sources suggest that while the overall bill of materials is set to drop, it's not going to be uniform across all the different components. Yeah. Yep. Bank modeled curves, for instance, they show batteries dropping in price faster than, say, precision gearboxes. So what does that mean? It means the companies that really master drivetrain durability, the ones that can improve the mean time between failure or MTBF. That's how long it works without breaking down. Exactly. Those firms that get the MTBF up to industrial norms might actually enjoy stickier margins and a more sustainable edge than those just focused on chasing cheaper battery cells. Ultimately, reliability issues and the need for rigorous safety certification, those things can significantly push back the payback period and slow down widespread adoption, even if the initial price tag looks good. So that directly challenges the idea that cost curves alone guarantee Chinese victory. Reliability is key. So the narrative often frames this whole thing as a zero-sum game, doesn't it? You know, one side wins, the other loses everything. But from everything you're describing, it sounds like that might be, well, an oversimplification. 
Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think zero sum is definitely an oversimplification here. It kind of obscures a much more complex reality. We're already seeing clear signs that point away from that. Things like cross-licensing of components between companies in different regions. Okay. Joint ventures are popping up like Huawei teaming up with UbiTech or Accenture with Schaeffler and dual sourcing of critical chips. Right, relying on multiple suppliers. Right. Exactly. These trends point towards a much more entangled, maybe even co-evolutionary market rather than some simple winner-takes-all contest. This isn't shaping up like a battle where one country just captures the entire market. It's signaling a future with, I think, pretty complex global collaboration and interdependence. I understand. And if you look beyond just the dynamics that The Economist highlighted, the wider literature adds even more crucial context. Such as? Well, first, as we just talked about, component costs will fall, but yeah, not uniformly. Durability, specific engineering skill, those will remain key differentiators. Okay. Second, adoption probably won't be like flipping a switch. It's likely to follow an S-shaped curve. Meaning slow at first, then faster. Exactly. Morgan Stanley, for instance, they expect relatively slow uptake, probably until the mid-2030s, then followed by an acceleration, but only once reliability truly reaches Six Sigma levels, that means near-perfect performance, extremely low error rates, and maybe new business models like leasing emerge. So patience is needed. It won't explode overnight. Precisely. It'll mature gradually. And third, regulation. It's rapidly moving from basically silence to actually building a framework, a scaffolding. Uh, the rules of the road. You got it. China's already approved its first national technical standards for humanoids covering perception, motion control, safety. The EU has draft safety regulations in the works. And the U.S. is setting up a NIST that's the National Institute of Standards and Technology Testbed. Mm -hmm. All these initiatives point towards a developing global compliance layer. And that layer will fundamentally shape which designs can actually scale up safely and effectively. It's not just about building a cool prototype anymore. It's about building a robot that meets tough global standards for safety and performance. Okay, so let's try to summarize the key insights for you, the listener, from our conversation today. Yeah. It seems clear China has seized an early lead in integration. But it's driven not just by subsidies, but also by these incredibly dense supplier networks, mm -hmm. really aggressive cost down engineering, mm -hmm. and now this push for unifying standards. However, U.S. and European players, they still hold significant leverage in really crucial areas. Things like AI tooling, the intellectual property behind drive cranes, and that essential certification expertise. Yeah, that certification piece is huge. Absolutely. And all of that becomes critical as these robots move from just being demos in a lab to needing uptime guaranteed service contracts out in the real world. So what the economists called the great automaton race, it really isn't a sprint. It looks much more like a relay race. That's a good analogy. In the near term, you know, we should probably expect Chinese firms to supply a bigger share of the hardware, the physical bodies. While American firms provide a disproportionate share of the software, the AI brains, and those high-end chips, and maybe the Europeans, they continue collecting royalty checks on those Vita precision motion components. And what's really fascinating here, I think, is that the truly decisive question for this potential trillion dollar opportunity, mm -hmm. it isn't just about who generates the most hype or has the flashiest demo. It's really about who achieves the most robust reliability. We talked about Tesla's Optimus hiccup. That clearly shows that even very well capitalized players, big incumbents, they hit serious engineering walls when they try to scale production. The ultimate winner won't simply be the one who makes the cheapest robot. It'll be whoever closes that mean time between failure gap down to accepted industrial norms first. Right. And whether that company is Chinese, American, or maybe some kind of hybrid enterprise, they will be the ones who truly set the pace for this entire industry. So when we look at the future of humanoid robots, it's clearly not just about who builds the most or even who builds them the cheapest. It's about that engineering maturity. It's about the incredibly complex choreography of these global supply chains. And it's about the shared guardrails of regulation that are only just starting to emerge. So the question for you is, what do you think will be the single most important factor in shaping this incredible complex and rapidly evolving landscape? 